Chapter 36 Minley was so tired that she could barely remember what happened when they entered the village. She hardly remembered the clamor of people gathering around them and the loud cheers as Da'afu told about the destruction of the green tiger. And she vaguely remembered the big, soft hug of an elderly woman who pushed her inside a welcoming house. But she did remember the cozy, lovely feeling of falling into a bed, like holding a warm, steamed bun on an icy day. And then Minley closed her eyes and slept. When she woke up, three round faces peered above her like plump peaches. They were Dafu, Afu, and Ama, their grandmother. Each of the children dressed in their red-weighted cotton outfits. The rip in Dafu's pants was now patched. Had little movable stoves with them. With the heaters and all of them crowded in the room, Minley felt as if she were in a, in a warm oven of kindness. She smiled. Good morning, Ama said. The children giggled. Good night, Dafu said. You slept the whole day. Pretty soon it'll be time to go to bed again. Now, Da'afu, don't tease the girl, Ama said. Obviously, she was very tired. Here, Minli, drink this. Ama poured some tea from a pot and handed Minli a cup. Minli sipped it gratefully. The steaming liquid slipped down her throat smoothly and seemed to fill every part of her with a fresh energy. She took another sip of tea and breathed in the tangy fragrance which smelled familiar. This is nice tea, Minli said. Thank you. It's not tea, Afu said. It's the medicine that cures the tiger's poison. It is tea as well, Ama said. It is good whether you've been touched by the green tiger or not. Minli stopped drinking. Is there enough of this for the dragon, Minli asked, remembering how Agong had asked them to bring more medicine. Maybe we should take this to him. Da'afu laughed again. Don't worry, they said. We have a lot of it. It's made from the leaves of the flowering trees. And Da'afu already brought a large pot to your dragon friend, Ama said, her wrinkled face looking kindly at Minli. Yes, Afu said. Your dragon is doing fine. He and Agong were talking to each other when I brought the pot, and he even said thank you for saving him from the green tiger's poison. Minli sat back, relieved and cheered by their words. What was the green tiger? Da'afu said something about a magistrate, she asked. And how did you know this tea cured the tiger's poison? We found that out by accident, Ama said. The Story of the Green Tiger and the Tea When the green tiger discovered us four moons ago, we quickly learned he was not an ordinary tiger. It was not his color or his size. It was the anger he had for us. First, he attacked our livestock, the sheep, the pigs, the chickens. But not to eat, just to kill. He taunted us with his evil, leaving the dying animals in a row outside our door. Whatever animals he did not kill outright died within an hour or so from the vile poison of the tiger's touch. We knew it was just a matter of time before he caught one of us. We kept the children and whatever animals we had left inside. Agong, my husband, studied furiously, trying to find out more about this powerful monster who tormented us. We were running out of food when Agong finally discovered what the green tiger was. When Agong was a young man, he had made a journey to the city south of here and brought and bought an old book of history. That book, with our ancestors' ancient texts, was how Aegon discovered that the green tiger was the spirit of the magistrate our ancestors had tried to give the secret of happiness to, but had angered instead. During his life, the magistrate had filled his spirit with so much rage that when his body left, his spirit could not rest and instead turned into the green tiger. Aegon learned that the green tiger searched for all those he felt had wronged him. The tiger would punish us for his imagined offense, and then, when he felt the punishment was complete, destroy us. Afterward, he would find others who had wronged him and punish and destroy them as well. Who knows how many people he hurt before he came to us. Perhaps we were lucky he only found us four moons ago. In desperation, the men decided to form a hunting party to try to kill the tiger. But the green tiger was too powerful for us. Our swords and staffs were shattered by him. The hunting party returned, half of the men carried by the other half and almost all injured. The women and children, we tried to nurse the injured, but they kept getting sicker and sicker from the tiger's poison, and I began to despair. Though it had not worked on any of the animals in the past, I thought perhaps hot water could wash away the poison from the wounds. So even though it was dangerous, I left the house to get water from the well. Just as I returned, I saw the tiger. He was standing in front of our gate doing something peculiar. He seemed to be arranging things. I kept a far distance behind the trunk of a flowering tree. He soon finished and left, not noticing me. 
As soon as he left, I carefully rushed to the gate. The tiger had left a strange array of objects. There was a piece of broken vase with a moon on it, a mangled child's jacket, and two deep claw marks scratched into the stone. I knew it was a message, but what did it say? The only person who would know would be Agong, but he was sick and dying from the tiger's poison. My eyes filled with tears as I rushed inside. It was hard for me to keep from crying, and I was blinded by my own tears. So it was only when the fragrance filled the air that I realized that the water I was boiling had leaves from the flowering trees in it. They must have fallen in while I was hiding from the green tiger. It was too dangerous to go and get more water. Everyone was horrified that I had gone at all. So I used the hot leaf water to clean Agong's wound. And like magic, the poison began to melt away. I couldn't believe it. I gave Agong some leaf water tea to drink, and immediately his hoarse breathing was soothed and his face relaxed. Quickly, we used the tea on all the men, and by the time the last injured man was given the tea, Agong was sitting up in his bed with Da'afu at his side. I was a fool, he said to us. I should have known we could not fight the green tiger with more anger. We just add to his power that way. His anger is his strength, but can, but it can also be his weakness. His anger can blind him, and that is when he's vulnerable. Maybe if I can find who angered the magistrate the most, I can... You are definitely recovering. I had to smile. Already you kn you're making plans, but why don't you rest for now? No, Agong waved away my concerns. I must learn more immediately before the green tiger does more damage. I knew then that Agong needed to see the green tiger's message right away. Da'afu and I wrapped him in blankets and supported him as he hobbled to the gate. Agong looked grave as he examined the objects. Just as I thought, he knew right away what it meant. What is the green tiger saying? Afu asked. It says if we give him two children every month, he will leave us in peace, Akong said. This is the start of his punishment for us, the way we are to pay penance for our ancestors. How does it say that? Dafu asked. Two claw marks next to a child's clothes means he wants two children, and the vase is a symbol of peace. The moon on it means every month. So he offers us a month of peace for two children, Agong said. It matters not. We will not sacrifice even a baby pig to him. But Afu and I had other ideas, Dafu said, interrupting. After Agong found out that the person who angered the green tiger the most was his own son, he was a king, and he had banished the magistrate tiger from the kingdom. We made a plan. Yes, Afu said proudly, we decided we would trick the green tiger into getting so angry that he would destroy himself in the well. And our plan worked. It was also a plan that we did not approve of, or agree to, Ama said, shaking her head at them, even though she could not help smiling affectionately. But now, young Min Lee, you've heard our story, but we have not heard yours. We know your name and that you're friends with a dragon, and we can guess you are far from home. Why don't you tell us the rest? So Min Lee told them about Ma and Ba, their struggles in the muddy fields, the goldfish man and the goldfish. She told them about meeting the dragon that could not fly, and the monkeys and the buffalo boy. She told them about the king of the city of bright moonlight and the borrowed lines. She told them about her whole journey. And as she spoke, Da'afu and their grandmother laughed and gasped and stared in wonder. Sometimes Amma shook her head. Sometimes Da'afu would look at each other in dif disbelief. But they did not interrupt once. So all of this is to get to Neverending Mountain, Da'afu said finally. We know where that is. You do? Minli exclaimed, sitting up in excitement. Really? Yes, Neverending Mountain is nearby, Afu said, about a day's journey. Minli looked at them in shock, and no words could come out of her mouth. A day's journey? After all their days of traveling, Minli couldn't believe they were so close. As soon as your dragon friend is well, Ama said, Da'afu will take you there, and then you can return to your parents. Minli smiled gratefully, but as she looked at their comfortable round pink faces, how both Afu and Dafu leaned against their grandmother, with devotion and how she rested her hands on their heads with tenderness, Min Lee suddenly thought of Ma and Ba. A wave of longing washed through her and a dryness caught in her throat that the tea could not moisten.